This is Heidi Estrin from the Book of Life podcast, and before we start today's episode, I want to let you know that I'm about to celebrate my 10th year of podcasting. To mark the occasion, the Book of Life is joining Patreon. Whether you've been listening since 2005 or just started today, I hope you find these interviews with creators of Jewish books, music, films, and websites to be interesting, valuable, maybe even inspiring. And I hope you'll be moved to respond by becoming a Book of Life patron at patreon.com slash bookoflife. At Patreon, you can pledge as little as 50 cents a month to support the show, and every level of support comes with its own set of thank you rewards. Your small monthly donations will help pay the hosting and subscription fees that make the Book of Life possible. Any extra funds will buy materials for our sponsoring library, such as books, CDs, and films that may end up inspiring a future podcast interview. The Feldman Children's Library at Congregation B'nai Israel of Boca Raton, Florida, has always supported my podcasting efforts, and I'd like to return the favor by bringing in some funding to support the library. Please think about it, and check out the rewards packages at patreon.com slash bookoflife. Welcome to the Book of Life, a show about Jewish books, music, film, and web. I'm Heidi Estrin. The Book of Life is a podcast service of the Feldman Library at Congregation B'nai Israel in Boca Raton, Florida. Additional support comes from the Association of Jewish Libraries. Leslie Newman is a prolific author who has written a great deal of poetry and prose for adults and kids. She frequently uses Jewish themes and LGBT themes in her books. Her newest is a picture book from Abrams, Here is the World, a Year of Jewish Holidays. She spoke to me by phone at her home in western Massachusetts. Leslie, please tell us about your newest book, Here is the World. Here is the World is a celebration of Jewish holidays, and it uh, spans the first year of a young Jewish girl's life. So it starts with her naming ceremony, and then it progresses to Shabbat, and then goes into the new year of Rosh Hashanah, and goes all the way through to the following year. There are lots of different round-the-year Jewish holiday books out there. So what made you decide to contribute one of your own? Well, it's very interesting because the way the book began was I was doing a reading with another poet, and as a way to introduce her, I wrote a poem called Here is the World because she's a very joyful person. And there was no Jewish content at all. It was very different. And after it went around to many publishers and didn't find a home, and I don't even know why, but one morning I woke up inspired and I thought, what if I made it a Jewish book? And then it sold immediately. So that's the honest answer to the question. But, you know, when I was rewriting it, what I really wanted to do was infuse the book with joy. Because for me, the holidays are very joyful, even the somber ones like Yom Kippur And they really ground me throughout the year. They were important to me as a child to celebrate with my family. So I really wanted to pass that on to children. My hope is that they would really come to embrace the Jewish year with joy. Who was the poet that you originally composed the poem for? Her name is Andrea Avazian. She's a wonderful poet. She's also a minister and it was such a joy to read with her. And the end of the poem has stayed the same throughout. Here is a world ever-changing and new, spinning with joy at the wonder of you. So that, that has anchored the text all th- throughout. I mean, this is probably, the text that you see in the book is probably, I'd say, like the 20th draft. How did you decide which holidays to include in the book? Um, well, I wanted to include, you know, the big four, of course, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Hanukkah, and Pesach. And then uh, Shabbat, of course, is a holiday we celebrate 52 times a year, so that was important. And then there are other holidays that I love, like Sukkot and Tu You know, the holidays that I included were the ones that I'm the most familiar with. 
So, um, and the book had to be a certain length. Actually, picture books are usually 32 pages. This is a long picture book having 48 pages. They're printed in signatures of 16, so it really had to fit into that format. Can you talk a little bit about how you pared each holiday down to its very most essential elements? Because you've described them in basically two lines each. Yes, I did. Well, you know, I focused a lot on food, (laughs) (laughs) as you might notice. You know, again, I wanted to focus on joy. What I worked with was what stayed with me from my childhood, what was familiar to me. And so, of course, I remembered shaking a grogger during Purim. And I remembered wearing white on Yom Kippur. And I remembered, of course, lighting the menorah. So, you know, those are the images that were the strongest within me. So that's what I brought to the page. There is an explanation of each holiday in the back of the book. So I can bare bone it down and then add a more thorough explanation along with the recipes and crafts. And why did you decide to include Shabbat twice in the book? Because I like books that have some kind of circular nature to it. So the Shabbat comes very close at the beginning of the book and Shabbat comes close to the end of the book. And that way it's reinforced that this is a holiday that we celebrate more than once a year. In the end note, where you explain the customs and the holidays, you often say some of us or many of us do this or do that. So talk about your decision to keep the language so open-ended and inclusive. Well, as I'm sure you know, if you have two Jews in a room, you have at least three opinions. <laughs> so, there isn't one way to really do anything in Judaism. So I didn't want to come from a place of authority and force my customs and traditions on the reader. So I wanted to leave it more open. So some of us do it this way, and, and a reader could say, oh, I do it that way. And some of us do it this way, and another reader could say, oh, that's interesting, but I do it this way. So to keep it inclusive was important to me. Very good. Did you come up with the crafts and the recipes at the back of the book? Yes, I did. I am a former daycare teacher, (laughs) and I tried everything out. I had what became known in my house as Jewish Craft Day, and uh, we made uh, challah covers and cards and edible sukkahs. We made kugel and milkshakes and latkes, and we had a lot of fun. The illustrations by Susan Gall, they really emphasize the passage of time by showing that baby growing up as the year passes. And the text doesn't really mention a baby. The text starts with the baby naming, but it's a lot of the story is conveyed through the illustrations. Did you have to give guidance to your illustrator, or was this her own interpretation? How did that work? Well, first of all, I am so in love with these illustrations. I just thought she did the most amazing job, and she really conveyed the sense of joy that I was trying to get across with the text. So I am very, very grateful for her, and I think she's immensely talented. So I discussed it with my editor, and I wanted siblings because the reader of the book is older than the baby, right? Right. I mean, you know, a baby is too young for this text. So I wanted to make sure that there was at least one brother and one sister so that the book would appeal to children who are older than the baby. So that was my idea. The dog was her idea, and I love the dog. And then it makes lots of sense for the baby to grow because the book is going through a year. I love that the mom has my hair. That was really (laughs) great. Um, And, you know, I did give some feedback. For example, the illustrator at first didn't realize that on a menorah, the shamash is taller than the other candles. She had them all even. She had illustrated the latkes in a stack, like buttermilk pancakes. And I said, (laughs) no, they're really not served that way. So, you know, there were certain things that had to be addressed. But mostly, I was just enormously pleased and just loved the illustrations. They are beautiful. And I did send her pictures of things that I created for the crafts in the back. So, for example, I made an edible Torah, so I sent her a photo of that so she would know how to illustrate that. Now, Here's the World is just the latest in a long, long line of Jewish books that you have written. Are there any particular favorites that you'd like to describe for us? Well, my favorite is always my next book. So I can tell you I have several uh, Jewish children's books coming out. Uh, I have a book called My Name is Aviva, which is coming out from Carben. 
And it's about a little girl named Aviva who is displeased with her name because she gets teased. The other kids call her Amoeba. So she decides to change her name to Emily. But then when her parents tell her the story of how she was named and who she was named for, she comes to embrace her name. And then I have a book coming out next fall called Quetzal, The Cat Who Composed from Candlewood. And it is based on a true story about a cat named Quetzal. And you know, Quetzal means cat in Yiddish. And the cat was owned by a composer. And the cat composed a short piano solo uh, by walking down the keyboards. And it won a prize in a contest. <laughs> so when okay. I, I actually, the cat had an obituary in the New York Times. Wow. And when I read that, I thought, well, there's a children's book waiting to happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I wrote that. And in terms of what has been published, I must say A Sweet Passover is very special to me because it has my dad's matzo bar recipe in the back. <laughs> and then some of my Jewish children's books feature my grandmother prominently, and she was very, very important to me growing up. So in Matzo Ball Moon, for example, there's a grandmother who makes chicken soup. Uh, one of my favorites. And then Runaway Dreidel. I also really like the illustrations in that book. They're painting and collage. Okay, cool. Do you think there's any particular hallmark of your Jewish books, something that makes them uniquely Leslie Newman books? Well, what I try to do in all my children's books, Jewish content or not, is to have the child in the book and then the child who's reading the book who will identify with that child feel good about him or herself in whatever way possible. That's what I try to do, whether it's the child feels good about his or her own identity, his or her family, a decision he or she has made, an attribute, something like that. Um, I just really try to help children feel positive about themselves and about the world. Beautiful. Now, you are also the author of the classic LGBT book, Heather Has Two Mommies. And you've written a number of books since then that positively portray gay and lesbian families. So talk a bit about how you got into that genre. Well, Heather Has Two Mommies was written in 1988 at the request of a woman who stopped me on the street and said, I don't have any books I can read to my daughter that shows a family like ours. Somebody should write one. And by somebody, I knew she meant me. I wrote the book. I couldn't find a publisher. And then a friend and I co-published the book by raising $4,000 in $10 donations before Kickstarter, all by (laughs) writing letters. Wow. Uh, And the book came out in 1989 from In Other Words Publishing, which was my friend's desktop publishing company. It was republished by Allison Books in 1990. And it is going to be republished in 2015 with brand new illustrations by Candlewood Press. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Do you feel there's any relationship between your Jewish books and your LGBT books? Do they have overlapping missions in some way? As I said before, the mission is for children to feel good about themselves, but also I think it's important for children to know who they are and where they come from. And in fact, the reason that I wrote Heather Has Two Mommies after hearing that request was I thought about my own childhood and how I didn't have any books that showed a Jewish family when I was growing up. I grew up in the 1950s and 60s, and I remember very distinctly the first time I came across a Jewish children's book. I was standing in a bookstore. I was 27 years old, and it was um, Mrs. Moskowitz and a Sabbath candlestick for the Shabbat. Mm-hmm. Candlestick. Yeah. And I burst into tears. Oh. And it was so meaningful to me to see a family like mine in a book. I had never seen that. And so I thought, if it's this emotional for me, what is it going to be like for a kid with two moms to see a book that shows her kind of family. So I had that emotional connection. Beautiful. Now, is there anything that you'd like to talk about that I haven't thought to ask you? Well, I have another new book coming out, which I would love to mention. Sure. Uh, It's not a book for kids. It's a book for adults. It's called I Carry My Mother, and it is a book of poetry that explores a daughter's journey through her mother's illness and death, beginning with her mom's diagnosis and ending with her first yard site. And it is coming out from Headmistress Press in January of 2015. Okay, we'll keep an eye out for that. And we didn't talk about my book, October Morning, a song from Matthew Shepard, which I would love to talk about. Please do. that book? I've heard of it. I haven't read it myself. Okay, so... 
Matthew Shepard was a gay college student attending the University of Wyoming in October of 1998 when he was kidnapped from a bar, robbed, tied to a fence, severely beaten, and left to die. And he was found 18 hours later by a mountain biker and brought to the hospital, and he died five days later, which was the start of Gay Awareness Week at the University of Wyoming, and I was the keynote speaker, so that's the day I got to campus. Wow. So October Morning is a novel in verse. It explores this tragedy through many different voices, including the silent witnesses to the crime, like the fence that he was tied to, the stars that watched over him, a deer that happened by and kept him company, as well as actual and fictitious voices. The reason I feel like the book has importance into the Jewish world is because, of course, one of our values is uh, protecting people, making the world a better place. Writing the book, I felt, was my attempt at tikkun olam, repairing the world, because within the book, after the poems, is an afterword in which I actually issue a challenge to the reader to do something to make the world a safer place for the LGBT community. And that book has been used in high schools all over the country. As well as colleges, it's been the common read for some high schools and colleges. I have a program called He Continues to Make a Difference, the story of Matthew Shepard, which I have given all over the country in high schools, colleges, libraries, conferences, etc. And it's something that I'm very passionate about. You know, what happened to Matthew Shepard should never have happened, shouldn't happen to anybody. And I feel like we all have a responsibility to perform tikkun olam, to make the world a safer place, especially for LGBT youth. Wonderful. Thank you for talking about that. That's really important. Leslie and Newman, thanks so much for speaking with us. Thank you for having me. And I appreciate all your well-thought-out questions. Oh, thank you. If you enjoy the Book of Life podcast, please become a patron at patreon.com slash bookoflife. Leave a review on iTunes or a comment on our blog at bookoflifepodcast.com. You can also like our page at facebook.com slash bookoflifepodcast, follow us at twitter.com slash bookoflifepod, email us at bookoflifepodcast at gmail.com, or leave us a voicemail at 561 561- Two zero six two four seven three. The Book of Life is a podcast service of the Feldman Library at Congregation B'nai Israel in Boca Raton, Florida, at cbiboca.org, and is supported in part by the Association of Jewish Libraries at jewishlibraries.org. Our background music is provided by the Freilach Makers Klezmer String Band. Thanks for listening, and happy reading.